coming to you live to Zoom from Waukesha, Wisconsin, Bismarck, North Dakota, San Diego, California, and the Oklahoma that got lost in California, Bakersfield, California, is the Constitution of American Life with the Friends of Publius. I am personally returning to the program after a lovely week in beautiful Seattle, Washington, where my lovely partner and I celebrated our 40th wedded year together. We chose to travel during the week of Labor Day because our research revealed that this was a great week to get flight and hotel on the cheap, which uh, seems consistent with America's view of labor. Think about it. So before we begin our discussion on the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, I want to check in with my fellow FOPs and uh, get their insights on a discussion that my lovely wife and I were having during our journey to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and it kind of has to do with some cultural changes in our lifetime. Uh, they're talking about how, you know, American culture, especially with social media and such, has become, uh, you know, uh, balkanized in so many ways. So I was wondering, when we're talking about this, did did you guys, when you were in your family, let's, let's put you middle school or younger, did you have a fam a TV show? in which the family watched all together, all right? Hung out together and watched and enjoyed family time watching. The Professor Rockford Moore, Files. The Rockford Files. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, uh, James Garner, right? Yeah, yeah. The entire family. Yep. Wow. Well, I forget, where are you in the birth order there, Professor Moore? I'm first. I'm first. So your younger siblings even like the Rockford Files. No, I didn't say they liked it. I'm just saying they watched it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who, who made the decision? Dad. Dad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Professor Williams? Oh, man. Other than giant games? I know. Well, I don't have a very good answer. I think it was 60 minutes. Okay. No, I like that. That that would That's make sense. Yeah, yeah. No, knowing your father, when I thought this question, I was going, you know, I can. The only thing I can think of is is either Oakland Raider games or San Francisco oh. Giant games. Yeah, our tradition was Sunday evenings. We would order in Chinese food, and we would watch sixty minutes. And I think Six Million Dollar Man came on before or after that, but he wouldn't watch that with us. Yeah. <laughs> Fresh Kavanaugh. Um, boy, searching the memory banks here. I think the one that got most of us around the little black and white in the den was uh, the Sunday uh, of Disney, right? Uh, the, the wonderful world of Disney. Disney. Yeah, yeah. And I forget where um, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom fell in there. See, that was Chris, the, we were raising the Saturday, Saturday, wasn't it? it was I'm Saturday? sorry. Was that Saturday? I thought no, that was Sunday. It was Sunday, was Sunday nights. We yeah. would have a. And then, Ponderosa, TV. I think Ponderosa was on during that time too. Bonanza, Bonanza, so Bonanza, yeah. Um, so yeah. that was that Sunday, that Sunday evening kind of, uh, you know, yep. trifecta. That we would have TV trays uh, uh, meals, and and watch Wild Kingdom and the Disney, and then uh, uh, I had to, then I I forget you know, but yeah, but then Bonanza kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so okay. same, same households there. Now, remember who was the, the who was the host of Wild Kingdom? Because I always uh, used to, Marlon Perkins. Marlon and Perkins. who was his assistant? Because he's the guy Stan. who always had to go wrestle the snake or whatever. Marlon's up in the in the helicopter while Stan's wrestling the giant anaconda. <laughs> it was always the always the thing, and then you know, which led to all kinds of funny jokes that I will not repeat since we're. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Well, thanks for sharing, that, gentlemen. So, students and teachers, in this episode, uh, we are going to be discussing the need for amendments to the Philadelphia Convention that arose during the ratification debates, a topic from Unit 2 of the We the People program. I do want to say to all students and teachers uh, of this period that it is important to remember one key, very, very significant factor about what those who wrote, debated, and ratified the Constitution, all right, uh, uh, what we can, you know, what can we assess from those? And that is that they had no pick an idea. All right. No pick an idea. If this system of government was going to work out, it is an educated guesswork at best. And all prognostications are based upon pure speculation. Now, my other three uh, fops here may disagree with me, but that's my insight is to, to think that we can 
all right, uh, uh, somehow read the minds of these people, and they they knew exactly how this would all play out. I I, I think is a uh, you know is is a fun parlor game, uh, but I don't know if it's well grounded there because I don't know if they had any idea uh, how this thing was going to play out. Um, I do have to recognize for a moment Professor Tim Moore in the Center for the Study of the American Constitution. Uh, Mr. Moore sent me numerous primary sources on this subject that helped enlighten me on the need and substance of proposed amendments. The one thing that really stuck out for me was that Pennsylvania proposed a constitutional right to hunt and fish on your own land. I uh, hope we have time to explore that all important right and uh, figure out why it's not in the Constitution, to my knowledge, unless it's some other First Amendment right. So let's begin our discussion. And tonight we're going to start with uh, Dr. James Michael Williams from the University of San Diego, partly because I, I just want to do what I said we shouldn't do, and that is we're going to play a speculation game. And yeah, since political you. scientists are much more into political behavior and political Ooh. culture than historians are, I thought it'd be good to start uh, with Dr. Williams here. So I'd like you to get into the minds, if you can, of the uh, delegates uh, to Philadelphia uh, and, uh, and, and the document that they would send to the Congress of the Confederation. Do you think that these 39 who ended up signing all right, uh, the Philadelphia Constitution. Do you think that many of them signed reluctantly? All right, uh, or were they kind of all in and this is the this is the best, you know, best government we could create? What's your sense about those guys? Yeah, I like thank you for pointing out that you're asking me to get into the minds of the uh of these guys <laughs> just when you said that we shouldn't be doing that. And um <laughs> I've been thinking, I mean, I think because I can get into the minds of of people who have since passed. It's uh, and I've I've been thinking about this. And do you know, while the song was not going to be released for almost two hundred years, as they were leaving the convention, those thirty nine, they were humming "Bridge Over Troubled Waters" by <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel, because that song that that Constitution was meant to be the bridge over the troubled waters that they just been going through. <laughs> <laughs> okay are you sure it was, uh, you sure it was uh, simon garfunkel and not crosby stills and I, nash no i mean i thought it was crosby stills and nash but after doing some research and talking to some good friends i realized i was mistaken so, <laughs> um, so it, it's a bridge uh, over troubled waters yeah i mean i think in a little more serious now i think uh i, I don't know about the i don't know about the idea of reluctant i mean here's Here's because you did say political scientists, we like to think about behavior and culture. We can't mind read. Um, the students should, you know, remember the history that 74 delegates were chosen to come to Philadelphia. Of the 74, I think around 55 actually showed up for some of the debates. And by the time we got to actually sign in the document, 39 were there. <clears throat> of the 39 that were there, I think if we if we trust Madison's notes, which I think I think we should to some extent trust like who was there and whether there are disagreements. Um, we know throughout that summer that there were major disagreements. I mean, starting with with uh, the Virginia plan that Madison did not introduce himself. He was smart enough to do that. But um, um, there was a lot of different opinions about um, what a new constitution should have. And even some, I think, who were questioning whether we needed a new constitution. So I, and, and this is where Tim and Chris can be much better because they're going to have the historical sort of information to fill this in. I, I think the 39 that signed it um, signed it thinking this was the best they could do this summer um, to do two things. And this is where I'm going to borrow from what Tim and Chris and you have taught me, Dave. Um, one was the importance of commerce, right? They had a document that was going to maybe open up some commerce between the states and with the with what would become the United States and other nations. And, you know, thinking about their own protection in terms of what will it look like if they can't get together and actually um, fund an army to protect themselves from um, Great Britain and other powers. I think the 39 that signed it left thinking they, they came up with the best they could to solve those two big issues. Um, but given that they immediately started um, working to make arguments to get it ratified, knowing that was going to be such a huge sell. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, 
I don't think reluctant. I think I would say more that they weren't sure if it was going to work, but they had come up with the best chance of something working. Well, I am correct in saying that that not everybody present at the time signed it. Is that, is that accurate, gentlemen? Correct. I mean, I, at least I know of George Mason. Mason does not sign. Right. Well, Gary, Gary and Randolph too. Right. Okay. So that that's what leads me to say, okay, what I'm just wondering, what 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 are these people thinking about at the time on whether or not they're going to sign? Well, or not. I, that's what I'm I'm kind of yeah, wondering. Let yeah. me get Tim and Chris can fill in these details, but I mean. One of the last, I mean, Gary Randolph and Mason, the, one of the last things they did that summer was put up an amendment wanting to include some form of a Bill of Rights in the Constitution, right? And it got struck down. I think they're the only three that voted for it. And it was at that point that they, I, I think they decided they weren't going to sign it. So um, they that's what they were thinking. They really wanted something that that protected individual rights in the document. And when they couldn't get it, that's what was the final straw for them. But Tim and Chris know this stuff much better than I do. Well, yep. I think, David, you said something uh, in your introductory remarks that's really actually, uh, it ties in specifically to Elbridge Gary. Um, I, I forget the phrase you used. They had no idea what they were doing. Um, I think Elbridge Gary is a good example of that because he shows up at the convention and he's very much in favor of, of a stronger, um, um, a, a stronger central government. And then by the time he gets to, uh, you know, mid, late August, uh, he's he doesn't like what's evolved over the summer. So, you know, he comes into the convention believing A, and at the end of the convention, he doesn't sign their work. So I think your point is well taken that um, throughout that summer, I mean, they're all nationalists to start with. They're all um they're all in favor of a strong national stronger national government so they're all nationalists in that sense but are you Gary, talking about i the... think is a good example to your point about how um as it evolves um it winds up something different and, and gary um um you know actually mason proposed a second convention um uh, too mm -hmm. i think like real late maybe the last day or so but that, I think that's a good, uh, um, a really good point you made about um, kind of making it up as you go and and not liking what you made up as you as as you went along. Chris, any thoughts? Well, I just I think to and if for the students that are actually for the teachers uh, that have, have heard us before and for the students that, that you know one of the things we like to say is because you read this in the media today, you know the minds of the framers. You know, the, the, the minds of the framers and the founders were not monolithic, you know, so the idea that, uh, you know, to try and throw them on the couch and speak for them as a collective group just doesn't work very well. That's just not good history. Um, and you, David, I think you're absolutely right, because, I mean, Governor Morris, James Wilson, uh, you know, the two guys who were played a huge role at the, at the convention, both afterwards say, hey, I'm paraphrasing, this is the best we could do. And you know what, if there are mistakes, we gave you that we gave you the way to fix those mistakes and there may be mistakes things we didn't consider so you have the amendment process um and we hope that future generations can fix any mistakes that you found with what we we produced so that was the best we could do at the time so professor moore as we look specifically at the question that the students are asked uh, to deal with it seems like they're presented with a binary choice that there's a binary choice during the ratification debates, i.e. anti-federalists are for amendments, federalists are opposed. That's that's That was my first reading, uh, 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 my first response to reading it the, uh, mm -hmm. the first time. Is it that simple of an equation or was this issue somewhat more complicated than that? Yeah, I, I think... Um... I know in episodes past, you've kind of always started out with like preliminary thoughts. And so I'm going to do the preliminary thoughts um, about the question since you've asked about the question. Um, this is, um, look, students, teachers, hear me now and believe me now. Um, this is not a question about adding a bill of rights. This is This is a question about two things, what the amendments will be. Will they be limited to just rights or will they also be amendments that are um, uh, maybe we can get into this later structural amendments like, I, you know, we don't like the way the Senate works. We don't like the way, 
you know, the, the actual structure of the system. So this question, do not perceive this question as a question just about bills, a bill of rights. It's more about, um, in fact, most of the recommendations from the state ratification conventions were structural suggestions, um, more so. Now, New York and Virginia have structural, there's 20 of those, and then there's 20 rights that they also recommend. So students don't don't think that this is just about Bill of Rights be, because, well, even in that, it's not binary either. So there there's a there's a complexity to what the amendments would be. And there's also a complexity as to how those amendments would be achieved. Uh, so it's a, a content question as well as a process question. I, I can't stress that enough because uh, if you only see it as a Bill of Rights question, um, I think you're missing the the fuller picture of what was going on at that time. And and once again, well, I, I guess I just I want to make sure because you talked about process. To the best of my ability in looking at this, it seems like there were three options. One you already mentioned that was a second convention, yeah. and yeah. another one I didn't think about was I guess the Confederation Congress could have. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, thing. there's different kinds of anti-federalists here on this process question. Um, I mean, right at, I think, uh, September 15 or 16, um, Mason said, hey, why don't we have a second convention for them to look at what we've done this summer? Um, and that got voted down pretty quickly. Um, but then uh, after it came out in September 17, the con uh, they sent it to the Articles Congress, and in the Articles Congress, Richard Henry Lee, and the only reason we know this, by the way, because uh, this wasn't on the, in the congressional record at the time, the only reason we know it is because Nathan Dane kept his notes. And Nathan Dane records that Richard Henry Lee proposes amendments during the Articles Confederation as they were considering it. What should we do with the Constitution? Should we just pass it along without comment? Should we add amendments to it and then pass it along to the state ratific uh, ratification convention? So Lee actually proposes amendments during the Articles Congress phase when it's being transmitted through them to the states. Now, as the ratification procedure goes on, there are anti-federalists who are in favor of a, a whole new convention. There are anti-federalists in favor of um, a, um, prior amendments. They weren't. They didn't want just recommendatory amendments. They wanted. Um, they wanted amendments prior to their ratification. Um, and eventually, when we get to mid um, eighty eight, New York uh, Governor Clinton in New York and uh, in Virginia, they start to cooperate on calling for a second convention. Um, and there's a circular letter that floats around all the all the states urging their states uh, to call for a second convention. Um, so, so, yeah, you're right. There's there's a couple, three, maybe four different flavors of this. I mean, there's even some folks in Pennsylvania that want to decertify Pennsylvania's <laughs> interesting word. They want to decertify Pennsylvania's ratification because it was kind of shady to be, to start with. Um, so they actually hold a convention in Harris, Harrisburg um, and then, quote, send along their recommendatory amendments. Now, there's a lot of folks in Pennsylvania that don't. They see these people as as, uh, you know, vicious, pernicious. They want to undo everything. They're not in, interested in adding amendments. They're interested in destroying the whole um, the whole system. So you're right. There's different flavors of process as well as what would actually be the amendments. You're right. Well, Professor Kavanaugh, Tim has kind of anticipated uh, you know, uh, one of the things uh, we were going to try to draw a distinction, and that is that is generally when we talk about amendments and proposed amendments to the Constitution, generally the assumption is it's, it is about rights. Uh, it's all about rights. Um, but as Professor Moore points out, there's a lot of structural things. So two, two things I'd like to, to have you comment on is, is do you see any kind of pattern in those structural amendments or, or structural complaints that people have? And secondly, back to the question I asked Mr. Moore, 
is it binary? Uh, and I guess, you know, can, do federals and anti-federals all fit neatly into a box? Or do you see federals and anti-federalists kind of on a spectrum? Depending upon the issue, they're all over the place there. I'm dealing with your second question first. Um, I think it's interesting because there are going to be some federalists that will simply accuse the anti-federalists of this is a smokescreen. This whole complaint about a lack of a Bill of Rights is merely a smokescreen for delaying the ratification of the Constitution itself. So they're trying to think of, you know, I don't know, playing to people's fears. Who would do that? What kind of demagogue would play to people's fears? I don't even know. But uh, so there are some Federalists that are <laughs> believing that, uh, you know, that the anti-Federalists were really not all in on this whole idea of a Bill of Rights or these prior amendments, if you will. Um, and that's they saw that as a way to uh, pull on, uh, tug on people's emotions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, Tim made the point, it is definitely not binary because well, Richard Henry Lee and his proposals uh, at, the, at the Confederation Congress, uh, one of the things, uh, Privy Council, they liked the idea of a Privy Council, and he had that in there. So he had, in his proposals, he had also individual rights that we think of that, you know, existed as a protection from the government, but he also has uh, a, a suggestion for the Privy Council, which more than uh, more than he has suggested that. Um, also, the idea that uh, the Senate is too closely aligned with the executive. Now you have the vice president, this part of the executive branch is also now president of the Senate. They did not like that. The Senate had too much power. There are people who believe in the way the election process for the president was not accurate. So there were a, a multitude of issues that were um, structural. You know, the idea that they would like to see changed, but what's gonna resonate for people or rights. What's going to really resonate to the anti-federalist base is uh, what about freedom of the press? What about the you know right to a fair trial, even though it's in the body of the Constitution? There are jury trials in the body of the Constitution. So there are a number of rights that you know state governments already have protected in their bills of rights. Um, that I think the anti-federalists saw that would be also make sure we throw that in there too. And um, I want to step just for a second for students. Uh, the Center for the Study of the American Constitution is your one stop shopping for this almost entire unit. Uh, you will find documents uh, here that uh, are out the wazoo. Tim's website is a phenomenal website. And I, I do believe I know you can. I'll put the link to it. You can find Richard Henry Lee's uh, suggestions uh, to the Confederation Congress. You can find every state. And as I said in the opening, uh, uh, I spent a, a fairly long time reading multiple states' uh, recommendations. And I, I'll have to say, and I, I'm curious if you guys uh, think I'm as wacky as I possibly am, I, I guess. I, I kind of saw, you know, uh, the beard thesis uh, uh, developing there. There seemed to be a lot of economic issues, taxation, uh, a couple of states, no grants of monopolies uh, yeah. by the central government, trade, commerce issues. So, I mean, do you guys, so part of me is going to why, you know, why is everybody, ba you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, bashing on uh, on beard uh, here because there seems to be a body of evidence that suggests that the uh, that the ruling class was uh, very much uh, concerned about economic issues both sure. federal well but I, I'd say beard was uh, partially right I'd just say he over he overstated the portfolio argument but one of the things like the structural uh, your question uh, that Chris was addressing there is a pattern that just screams. And, and it's over the word expressly. Almost every state, when the, after Massachusetts, when they send along these recommendatory amendments, first of all, they're concerned about the consolidation of power at the national level. I mean, that's all over these recommended amendments, too. And to Chris's point about the power of the Senate, power of the executive. Um, but they also, almost every one of them say there needs to be something in the Constitution that this Congress only can do what is expressly delegated, expressly written. That's all over. And that's yeah, a structural that, thing. That's they do one not of the, trust. That, 
very much so. But so my my obvious follow up to that is why don't we find the language expressly in the Tenth Amendment? Uh uh how much time I, do you have <laughs> <laughs> and again maybe that's best left for the students to think about because yeah you read these documents yeah. and i think that is probably the most the, the most numerous reference is to yeah. this what will become the 10th amendment yeah. in, in 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 the states during ratification my answer yeah, to that is what, madison doesn't madison doesn't want to put that word there because it's a, it hamstrings the well, I understand. I, I yeah, I understand Madison, but the fact that this was ratified, you know, by you know uh, the Congress and the states and the people, does make me wonder. Okay, what was what was going on there? What but, I also found. Go ahead, hey, Chris. Hold on. Uh, I think part of that is explained timing wise, right? Yeah. The time the the proposed amendments are making their way through the states for ratification, the Constitution has been in place. First Congress has been doing its thing. You know, these this is a, a bill of rights that's not going to be amended till or ratified until 1791. Yeah. So at a certain point, you have a little bit of I'm going to say fatigue, maybe, or the idea is like, okay, it's working. Let's give it a chance. We'll see um, that kind of thing. And back to your point about the economy, um, I think it's both federalists and anti-federalists. I think you have federalists like a Hamilton or a Madison uh, and and others. Uh, Wilson, for sure, um, that think long term, big picture. And I think you have anti-federals like maybe a Patrick Henry, uh, who thinks uh, and more provincially, you know, uh, this is going to upset the apple cart because now we have a pretty good in the state of Virginia. I have a pretty good in the state of Virginia. Now we're going to create this other government. How much power would they really have? And how much is that going to dip into my uh, pocketbook, so to speak? Um, so I think both sides were interested in economic issues. So another point of clarification I, I could help you some help with is one of the other more frequent re uh, references is to Article One, Section Four on elections. All right, and I, I I'll be honest, it, it kind of baffled me uh, there because that's in the body of the Constitution, yeah, right? But it seems to me that the pattern is they don't want. The, the language that is there, they don't that the that the majority of states don't want that language. Is that an accurate understanding Absolutely. from those documents? It's Professor one of the most it's one of the most objected to by anti-federalists that uh, potential potential federal control of local elections. I mean that um uh, there it's it's odd because today we barely turn out for local elections. But in that day local elections were all that in a bag of chips. So there there's tremendous blowback on the potential control of local, and there's that's the consolidation principle again Jim, that we're objecting to. Essay, Bruce had an essay that was, uh, gosh, what essay? Bruce essay was he was ripping on uh, the Article One, Section Four that Dave alluded to. I can't remember off the top of my head. Might have been eleven. I, I I don't 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 quote me on that, but um, yeah, I mean it's all over. It's all over the anti-federalist writings. Yeah, and then other again, other. I mean, there's it students. It's it's really fascinating to look at these recommendations, uh, and again, it, it it can be confusing in a lot of ways because a lot of the recommendations obviously deal with things that are in the body of the Constitution. Yeah, and uh, and even though there seems like there's frequent recommendations, most of those don't seem to change. Which again, I think probably goes back to Madison and what influence and control he had over the process. And possibly Chris just pointed out, or you know, uh, the fatigue factor uh, uh, with all of this. Uh, so go ahead, Mike. So just, it's a it's a question for all of you. Um, after 1791, did states keep sending recommendations for amendments? Rhode Island did. Okay. Yeah. And no. even, in even in '89, here's the uh, to Chris's point about timing. Even in February, as Congress is gathering to meet, uh, New York and Virginia are still calling for a second convention uh, in, in early February. And that, that still kind of ripples through um, as the first Congress gathers. And they're, they're not interested. They're tr trying to figure out how to raise money and get an army and organize the executive. And uh, so, so, yeah, Rhode Island, even when they ratify in 91, they're still sending along recommendatory amendments and at that point there's already a bill of rights yeah so professor moore uh 
I'll, I'll say that, you know, reading through these documents, I quite possibly have found myself changing some th opinions and thoughts about something that I believed for, I don't know, 30 years. And that is, I, I've always viewed those pushing for amendments, especially structural amendments, uh, were, or even Bill of Rights, you know, even Bill of Rights, that, that on the sincerity scale, <laughs> they lacked... <laughs> They lack sincerity. That they, they didn't. Really, they, they weren't the concerned with that document, that constitution. They wanted. They wanted to to uh, undermine the whole thing, get rid of what came out of Philadelphia, uh, and many of them would be quite happy to go back to the articles with maybe a few tweaks. Uh, what do you think about that? I, I mean, again, I, I don't. I, we're going to get into the, try to get in the minds of the of this group, but where do you put them on the sincerity index for those who want these amendments? Well, I'll, I'll give you another index. I'll call it the um, the rootin' tootin' anti-federalist o-meter. Um, I mean, there are some. You're right. There are some anti-federalists. They're not the least bit interested in just a bill of rights. They are interested in the whole system coming down. Um, and this, uh, you know, you you you. This is the thing about when you read the formal documents. You know, when they get together and, you know, they send along recommendatory amendments, you know, it just sounds like they're sending along, hey, here's some good ideas. You start to read their letters and they, you you discover that <laughs> between, you know, in private conversations, that comes out that they're very interested in totally getting rid of this proposed constitution. So in some ways, the anti-federalist, it, it is kind of a fig leaf. Uh, to propose just a bill of rights because some I mean Grayson and um, and Lee in Virginia are just livid with uh, the bill of rights that comes out of Congress they, they're absolutely livid with Madison's proposed amendments because there's nothing in Madison's proposed amendments that are structural so the root and tootin anti-federalists are very uh, angry because they do want to take the system down now um now, I, in terms of the disingenuousness, the Federalists are disingenuous in saying it doesn't need any amendments to start with. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, disingenuousness here in this argument. But again, uh, some of it is uh, personal motivation. Some of it is timing. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. There is a there's a lot of duplicity in what really is behind this movement for amendments. It's it's politics. I mean, it really is. It's it's. Is politics for the students that actually will dive into these arguments. It is uh, it's, people are stretching the truth, as Tim said. Uh, you know, there there's some are genuine, some are absolutely disingenuous. I think of uh, my boy Wilson at the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention. <laughs> I, you know, some of the stuff he was saying, and then he was taken to task about you know saying, well, it's not in there, so you know we don't have the power to do it. But therefore, we don't need a bill of rights and. And I think uh, maybe a guy's name is Smiley countered him in his argument about, well, yeah, but then why'd you put this in here about this right if that's not an issue? Um, so there's there's a it really is a political debate, I think. It uh, seems to be some of it borders on demagoguery, though. So are you saying? Oh, no, no, not. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. Well, oh. are you saying, Professor Kavanaugh, that there really is no difference in you know all politics is all demagoguery? No, no. No, I, I don't think it's all demagoguery. Uh, I think Duplicious. Uh, I think, you know, and, and, and your answer, well, that's just politics. And well, that I, would say, like I would say this. The folks that wanted structural amendments, that was pure politics because losing control at the state level means I lose my control at the state level. So I think the structural amendment people were very much immersed in the, pol the politics of constitution making. The folks that were pushing for amendments, I I tend to see those as a little bit less involved in the politics, but the structural people definitely that and, is a political threat. And those structural people understood that they were again to my point earlier. They understood that it was easier to to play on people's fears yeah. if you're worried about these individual rights. So yeah. I mean, they may not have been totally. Uh, behind the idea of rights we, we think of now in the Bill of Rights because they were wanting to actually hamstring this new government before it even started because of the fear of, of uh, 
them losing the juice that they had at the state level. Yeah. Yeah. And, and students, this goes back to something I think Tim said at the beginning that of the, the 39 or the 40 ish who were there at the end, I think Tim said at the beginning, they were all to some extent nationalists, right? To some extent, the existing structures they were operating in, they didn't feel like power was flowing enough to a central government. So it's not surprising that while some didn't get everything they wanted, like they didn't get some didn't get as much national power as they wanted, they all they created a document that definitely gave more. So when you're thinking about, I was just thinking about making sure the students understand this idea of structure. It's not just about like a changing the words so that um, there's maybe more people in the Senate or less people. It's not about that. It's about how power flows through a system. And what Tim just said and Chris just said really get to it. Um, we've been living in a place in a, under a government where power was flowing from the states primarily, and this was really altering that. So it was really um, political and really it seemed like life or death to many pe people that you were creating the system where it was so much more national power. Yep. And I think too, and I, I want to go back to a point Tim had made at the end of the convention when Mason proposes uh, this Bill of Rights, uh, I think there no there's there's no vote in favor of it. There's no state. Uh, I don't think there are any any necessarily other than himself uh, uh, members of the convention that actually vote to 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 add this. Yeah. So there was no um, there was no groundswell at the convention. There was no uh, faction at the convention. It was like you know George Mason. We're we're done. We're done. Um, so we're not gonna. We're, we're tired. We've been here for a while. Um, so we're out. Well, here's where the Federalists are a little. Well, there aren't any Federalists at the convention, but those uber nationalists this is where they're disingenuous. Oh, we weren't sent here to do rights. We were here, sent, you know, like well, no, you weren't even sent here to do the Constitution either. <laughs> so, so there. Uh, so their retort to Mason about his proposal was, in my estimation, a little disingenuous too, because they they didn't do what they were supposed to do to begin with. So, Professor Kavanaugh, the students are asked in the, the last section of this question to assess the need to possibly change the amendment process. And I guess I, I'm wondering, I'm, what I'm curious about is it seems that, you know, that there's a very, there's been a very current desire to change that amendment process. And I'm wondering if, if in fact, it's not historical. That, that there's been a frustration with the amendment process from the beginning, or am I wrong there, that this really is a more modern kind of issue? It's a, it is a more modern type of issue, because if you think about it, we've had three great bursts of uh, amendments, if you will. You know, there's the post-Civil War, uh, you had the uh, progressive era in the early 19-teens, uh, and then you have the... Uh, rights revolutions of, of the late 50s and into the early 60s, which will follow through um, into the 70s. Um, and since then, obviously, we've not had uh, any amendments added. Um, people have complained about it and they have proposed changes, but um, uh, there's, there's no real groundswell to get behind that. So it is a very modern type of thing. Uh, my personal thought is that, uh, you know, it'd be nice if we could amend the amendment process, but that's not going to happen because, of course, uh, in our Article 5, um, states are given power. And um, because, you know, this is just the way the convention worked. And um, mathematically, you could get the requisite number of states, three-fourths of the states, and still have less than 50% of the population to actually favor a change in the Constitution. I'm not sure that's what the framers intended. I certainly know it's not what Madison intended. Um, so, but this is a more modern uh, reflection, David, I think of our frustration with a, a government that perhaps uh, gives too much power to the minority or too much power to the states. Well, and but what I, you know, and, and what I find interesting about that is if you look at what you, you call the three births, they really are, it seems to me, about 50 years apart. I mean, if we look at the 13th, 14th, 15th, you know, uh, in, in the Reconstruction period, then we look at the progressive, eh, there's around, you know, 50 years uh, there. And then from the progressive uh, to uh, the civil rights, a little less, 
uh, than 50 years, uh, but, you know, somewhere in a, in a generational. And, and now we're at that point. And, and maybe that's why we're seeing that frustration, because the last, well, I guess the last amendment that has been added was in the 1990s, but that was proposed in the, uh, what, 1780s, <laughs> 1790s, I guess. The fantastic story about uh, the power of one person, right, to affect change. But I think also you have to look at those those time periods that I mentioned. What had happened? I mean, you have a you have a, a civil war, right? That literally tore the country apart. And how do we mend the country to try and make it much more inclusive for all people? Therefore, you get some very powerful amendments. You fast forward to the more progressive era, and you have uh, this movement um, that scares the powers that be, right? Uh, because you you see what's going on in other parts of the world, say Russia, and you see people rising up. And so the pendulum pushes back, you know, so we're going to go ahead and make these, uh, uh, you know, we're going to have an income tax. We're going to have a direct election of senators. Uh, we are going to uh, allow women the right to vote uh, in the, with the 19th Amendment. So you start to see uh, in re reaction to historical events and clearly the, the civil rights amendments or the, what we end up having as a, as a result of, again, trying to expand the us and reduce the other and to get more people uh, a seat at the table. Yeah, Tim. I have uh, two thoughts. I mean, I think Chris is right. It's more of a modern thing. But there were a couple of instances early in our history where, like, for example, in 1815, there were a bunch of folks that gathered in Hartford. Uh, Connecticut that were very angry about the structure or how the history was evolving. So they actually proposed amendments um, to the Constitution. They were good and angry about what they called the Virginia dynasty. They, they proposed all kinds of structural changes in how the Constitution would work. None of them, um, um, I think it, it, it was such a regionalized set of anger that it didn't go very far. But there's also a ton of redoing, there's a ton of constitutional conventions in the 1820s and 30s at the state level. There's all kinds of um, structural changes. And I think probably in response to the, uh, you know, the rise of, of democ Jacksonian democracy. So there is um, it, there is some of this structural success at a, at a, at a state level. Um, um, but I, I think I think Chris is probably right on that. Uh, this is more modern frustration, but it, it has been there. Well, and it seems to me, Professor Kavanaugh, that you seem to be kind of grounded in realism and uh, and presenting an idea that this question is really a is really a power game. That you know, if students are going to be real honest, is oh sure we can consider it, but it ain't going to happen because in order to do anything about it, to fix it, we got to use the current system in which we believe is broken and corrupt. Oh, <laughs> those are your words, not mine, David. But yeah, I'm close. <laughs> Um, yeah, they are. Um, I, and I think it's, you know, I, I always, you know, the what, what, how could we amend the Constitution today? Is it is it actually amendable with where we are right now as a nation? What it, what issue is so pressing that we could amend the Constitution and we could get the requisite number of states as well as lawmakers to agree well, and, that's what I, well, Chris, and that, that's, to me, the one unifying theme is the frustration that the American people feel with the system, and therefore an amendment to make it easier to amend might, in fact, have the force, all right, of a majority feeling, since since the, the multiple factions are, in fact, frustrated with, with the, the structure, the system as it is. Closest I think that we've gotten to, and I have to look this up, maybe I'll look it up and I'll attach it to the resources, is uh, Indiana's former Senator Birch Bayh was looking into this in the in the 70s and uh, had gotten close, but he couldn't get enough people behind him on this because of the frustration about certain things he felt needed to be done. But I mean, I mean, it's, uh, I, my, my, this is my opinion, students, so you feel free to disagree with me, but I think climate change is probably one of the most important pressing issues that we face today as a world, not just as a nation, but as a world. But we we couldn't, you know, we couldn't, we can't get enough people to get behind that. Um, I remember uh, being at a, a, a conference with Akil Omar, 
And he talked about the idea that you have to convince people that, you know, we're being attacked by Mars and um, that would bring us together. But that attack right now, he alluded to climate change. And even then, we're not going to get enough people to 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 agree on this because. See, we... and, and I think politically speaking, I think that's the problem. If you're trying to amend the Constitution to make it easier to amend, you can't attach specific issues to it. Or, or you have to attach issues that go across the spectrum. So was, say, okay, for those of you over here who want, you know, you're frustrated because we can't get a balanced budget amendment. Yeah. And for those of you over here who are frustrated that we can't have a pro-life amendment under the current thing, that you throw all these things at it, and therefore people are going to get on the bandwagon. Be, but you can't attach a, spe a specific issue. We need to amend this so that we can amend this. Go ahead. That was a separate issue in terms of throwing out climate change that, you know, I'm thinking of what's a, a what was an incredibly pressing issue, because um, certainly, you know, some of the things that you mentioned, uh, the balanced budget amendment, which has been around for a while, which is, um, you know, kind of a, honestly a foolish idea uh, for those of people that are proposing it. It's just as countries aren't countries don't operate like businesses or families, uh, but that's a whole nother issue. Uh, certainly the pro-life amendment uh, as it stands now states can decide what they want to do and that seems to be what people had wanted but um yeah so i was just throwing out a specific issue that i think it goes across borders and across uh, borders of states and across borders of nations but yeah we'd have to think about uh we want to but of course you know that's the next thing david when we say okay we're going to amend the amending process and the 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 people are that all the people are going to go why and what? what i'm saying is if i'm the political strategist all right that i you know i'm not i i'm, I'm going to grab uh from as many you know uh uh you know uh, areas that i can you know to to try to bring a consensus uh together as we know the the progressive movement is is drawn from very a lot of different movements of the late 19th and early 20th century yeah. and in the same thing and we can't but we can't make this a specific issue if what our goal is is just to change the amendment process uh you know and and whereas you say dobbs I, dobbs didn't settle it we know what one of the big questions to the republican nominees is do they support a national limitation on abortion and that's becoming a big issue within the Republic. So I think there's a lot of people out there, especially within Christian nationalism and possibly the evangelical groups that aren't satisfied with just Dobbs sending it back to states. They want a national and say, well, the only way you're going to get that is if we change the amendment process. All right. And we tease all the various groups with, hey, maybe you can do that if we change the amendment. So I was talking from a political, you know, well, kind of tactical uh, point it, of view of how possibly because to me, to students look at this and go, well, yeah, okay, yeah, we'd like to consider it, you know, but maybe getting them to think about how could we go about doing that? Because you're absolutely right. The division in the country, all right, is so stark right now to achieve the, the standards uh, within, uh, you know, uh, uh, Article 5 of the Constitution are just pretty much impossible, to, it seems, to achieve right now, Tim. But uh, be careful what you ask for. I mean, if history, um, if history is any value, <laughs> <laughs> think about this. They tried to amend the – now, the amendment process in the articles was ridiculous. But they tried uh, half a dozen, maybe uh, seven times during the 80s, and they all failed. And the frustration – to, to your point, that I think there has to be kind of a critical mass of frustration, really. And in the 1780s, that boils over and we get a whole new constitution. And, and there's your anti-federalist argument. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Let's just tweak the existing system. You gave us a whole new system. And by the way, an easier system to, uh, to, uh, to amend this constitution than the articles. So, so I think there's a frustration piece here that, that, uh, that is important to think about because I think the frustration, I mean, this 50 year uh, thesis you've got going, it got me thinking about this. Um, I think there has to be a critical mass of anger and frustration. And now, uh, be, but be careful if you want to lower the if you want to lower the bar in terms of amendment. You know, be careful what you wish for. I think it's I think it's that 
but I also think there's a level of, I think there's many things that Congress and the, the national government could do right now to address issues that they have the power to do it. That the real issue isn't the constitution, it's the fact that they're not using the power. Like yeah. we, Congress can address climate change, it seems to me. Yes, they so, could. But I think where this discussion is going is making me think like, um, it's a combination of the national government, there's a problem that needs to be solved and there's a consensus in the country that we need to solve this. Congress acts and then the court or someone says you can't do it. That's always been like, okay. Like, I mean, the, the Republicans after the Civil War tried <laughs> to pass some legislation, right? And they got, they got, the court said you couldn't do it. So that's, let's just do, go to the 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, the same thing with income tax. So the question is, is there a problem like that that we as a nation will have a consensus on that needs to be solved that the courts are going to say no? And what comes to mind is, I mean, it's in the news today, right? Uh, this uh, Google, this U.S. suit against Google. Well, what if we, what if in the next five, 10 years, Congress finally acts, passes some legislation to regulate um, these, these, uh, these internet companies? And the court comes and says, within our structures of the First Amendment and all this, you can't do it. Is that going to be where we as a nation have consensus that we need Congress to step in and regulate these companies? So is that going to be the issue that we decide that we can amend? Or is that the issue that we then convince people to amend the amending process. It seems like we're yeah. getting close. I think Dobbs is getting us close. I think Citizens United, um, but it even Citizens United, it, it hasn't cut through. It hasn't galvana, galvanized enough people to say we shouldn't be allowing this sort of structural power in our system. Um, um, I, Mike, I want to agree with you. And I think your point is absolutely on, on the nail. Uh, the idea that Congress has the power. Congress has so much more power than what it seems to be exercising to deal with issues that we face. And for the various reasons that we've, we've talked about before, uh, they they don't use that power. So is, is it the, the construction of the Constitution or is it operator error? I would say in this case, it's operator error. I think there's a, a good book I'll listen in the resources. It was uh, by Justice John Paul Stevens and six amendments that he would like to see to the Constitution. And actually, uh, several of them, more than several of them, are dealing with or correcting what he believes to be our poor, poorly reasoned or uh, poor opinions from the court on, on various issues. So uh, I'll list that in the resources. It's pretty interesting to, from a perspective of a, a former justice on the court. Well, Professor Williams, I, I you know, based upon your recent you know, comments. I'm curious. Are we outliers? Are, is is the United States an outlier when it comes to the amendment process, or are we pretty much, uh, you know, side by side with other, you know, democratic republic uh, kind of states? No, we're not. We're 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 exceptional in this case. And um, <laughs> uh, and I'll I'll share some things for us to put in the notes on this. I mean, a, a lot of different scholars have looked at this and different metrics, and we are, if not. Our constitution is not the most difficult to amend. Um, it's definitely in the top. It's in a group of five, right? Um, and what, what, what seems to make it so difficult is this is a two-step process, right? It's one is the the three force the three force requirement of the states. There are very very few other countries that require that high for for just an amendment to just any old sort of amendment. And you add on top of that this that it's not three quarters of Congress or three quarters in a referendum, right? It's three quarters of states. And in looking at, um, just briefly looking at it today, that's what's really unique. And it goes back to our founding, right? I mean, it's there on purpose. <laughs> we, we, get, we get the system we want with all, with all of its warts. And there was, there was such a concern about state power that this is sort of the, the one of the lasting um, consequences of that. This is where attempts to make changes to the constitutions have to go through these entities called states, and it's just really, really difficult. Um, a couple of the things I just wanted to raise on this, just to, from a comparative perspective, um, 
Many countries have what they call entrenched clauses and things that either cannot be amended or it's a higher it's a higher threshold. So in South Africa, to amend the constitution for any old amendment, it's really it's just two thirds of the national parliament. If it if it's going to amend what's called the founding provisions, this is the first section of their constitution where they say South Africa will be a, a democratic country. <laughs> it needs 75 percent. Right. And what's interesting for the students to think mm -hmm. about is when I think about our constitution, um, we don't call it entrenchment, but the what's what we can't amend, right, according to the constitution, is the composition of the Senate, right, that it has to be equal. Now, we could amend the constitution, we could give three senators to each state, right, um, and other scholars have looked at, let me make sure I get my notes right, have looked at... Um, the first clause in Section 9, which prevented Congress from passing any law that would restrict the importation of slaves prior to 1808, they interpret that as an entrenchment clause. So I would just have the students, I think that's another way to just, your constitution tells you what you value, right? And in South Africa, it's the value of the big issue, right? Maybe what's in our preamble, right? What we say. And for us, for the U.S. Constitution, um, it's the composition of the Senate. And it's may, maybe this uh, this ban on uh, uh, legislation on the importation of or slavery till 18, 1808. I just I think that's interesting to think about. And one well, of the, you know, we, we go ahead. Can I do one other thing? And I I, mean, I know probably this is probably should be saved to what hints, but um, the Alabama Constitution. I didn't know this. Alabama had the same constitution from nineteen oh one. 2022. They've just written a new constitution. The one from 1901 to 2022, they amended it 977 times where it became like, and most of it was amendments. So I would encourage like students to look at state constitutions <laughs> and think about what the requirements are in your state constitutions. Ask yourself um, how many amendments are there and, you know, do that as a comparative. Like, what would it look like if that requirement was in the United States? And and would you want a system where we had 50 amendments rather than 27, right? I, I think that's an interesting way to, to think through how a reform might have a consequence. Well, it, it seems to some extent that this, what we've been talking about here you know, in the last few minutes, gets to somewhat of my opening statement about the inability of the framers to have much of an idea of how this is going to play out, nor do they have much of an idea of what America is going to look like four score and so many years later and the 200 years later. And, and what jumps out at me, Professor Moore, is there were also a couple of states, a few states who had stru this structural change that I didn't quite understand. And it was the one to 30,000 representative number yeah. and that it would, it would cap at 200. Yeah. I, but then there was some other language. So in their mind, all right, you know, yeah, we're going to grow, but, you know, hey, we're going to cap this body at 200, which kind of shows that they had really no clue just how much we would grow right. uh, uh, there. Is, is that an, a, an astute insight on my behalf? Oh, it certainly is, uh, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Professor Richmond. Yeah, I mean, it goes to your point of uh, there's a rolling experiment. There's a rolling experiment here. Um, uh, and, uh, to, I mean, except the rolling experiment always in our system has to account for states. That's the F word federalism. That is, uh, I mean, even think about it. Uh, if we're going to amend the amendment process, it essentially is saying we're going to lower it, make the bar easier. We're addressing federalism. Just yeah. the way we addressed federalism going from a 13 unanimity under the Articles to the two-thirds, three-fourths in the Constitution, the next lowering is an address of federalism, and that is an unbelievably powerful concept in American history. Yeah, well, I do think I've, I, I my, and I want to go back. I, Mike, you're absolutely right. I'll, and where I disagree, I, I think we've reached that level of frustration if polling shows us anything, all right, the level of frustration in this country, regardless of what political affiliation you have, all right, is 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 really at one of the highest points in my lifetime. 
we can go, you know, the, we can go maybe back to the late 1960s, early 70s, in which there might have been, uh, uh, you know, numbers equal to what we're seeing today. But I do think there is one issue where you might have enough support, and that is an age limit for serving in government. All right, I, I do think that with <laughs> that we're hearing a lot of voices of concern about those who hit their 80s uh, uh, there. Just a thought. So as we always do, gentlemen, uh, uh, we wrap up our program with uh, recommendations as students uh, uh, are, are dealing with this uh, question. What uh, kind of insights uh, and recommendations do you have for students and teachers? Uh, Professor Williams? Well, I think I, I already gave mine. I think it's, I think it's, always a comparative perspective would be helpful here. So looking at what other states are doing, there's a lot of great information about what other countries are doing. There's a, a resource called Comparative Constitutions Project that I'll put the website on our show notes. It's a great place to just go and think about what other countries, other democratic countries are doing. I would, I don't think that, I mean, I know this is a unit two question. So maybe have that, have that in your head um, as just maybe an example. Um, but I think more importantly, it's going to broaden your thinking on this. I mean, the point is not just to answer this question. It's to think critically about how power is structured in the United States and how easy or hard it is to change that and what, what we think about that. So I think looking for comparative examples would be useful. Professor Kavanaugh. Um, I think Mike's point about know, know what your state does, know how your state operates is imperative. And I love the comparative piece too. Absolutely know the comparative piece. I think that's important. And also as as uh, uh, our fearless bus drivers uh, spoke earlier, you know, don't get stuck in the binary. Um, don't get stuck in the ideas either or. Uh, it, it's, you know, the, the way questions get written, we've talked about this on other episodes. Um, you know, don't, don't, don't be pigeonholed by the question because the idea that, as we've said, you can't speak for the mind of the, the, the Federalists or the mind of the Anti-Federalists because those minds were varied. So don't get stuck in that binary thing. Um, and think about, you know, again, I, I, I find myself saying this. If there's a problem, what are your solutions? What, what are your solutions? If you believe that we're too stuck, that we can't amend the Constitution now, um, how would you propose changing that? Um, and understand this too. Uh, a lot of these guys, uh, the framers of the Constitution, uh, were like, "Well, hey, we gave you this amendment process. It's not nearly as difficult as it was under the Articles. Why aren't you using it? If you perceive there's to be something, uh, some sort of problem, why aren't you using it?" And I'm, I know I'm speaking collectively now for the mind of the framers. Something I just told you not to do. <laughs> I thought you were speaking the mind of, of uh, Scalia there for a second, which which would be a tremendous irony. Gosh, I, I guess I was channeling my inner uh, Antonin there. But, you know, if if there's an issue, there's a process for fixing it. Right. There's And, and I think the framers would say that. Uh, I, I know they would say it because they've been quoted as saying it. But those are my view. That's my view from the cheap seats. Professor Moore. Yeah, I just reiterate. uh understand this question is more uh is about more than just adding a bill of rights it's about rights structures but it's also about the pro that, that bullet on the second the first bullet who had the better arguments well there's a lot of arguments if it's more than just bills of rights you add structure you add the difference of opinion about processes so there's a lot of possibilities in who has the better arguments um, so don't confine yourself to just a Bill of Rights discussion would be my uh, my thought. Well, every season we kind of come up with a maybe a word of the season. I'm still trying to figure out how to say apoplectic. I think I just said it right. <laughs> All right. Uh, first time in, in years, maybe. I think our new word of the season is pernicious. Pernicious. Right. Mm. pernicious. So uh, we're going to try to use the word pernicious as often as we can uh, for uh, this season. Uh, so uh, in our next session, uh, I can't I'm looking I'm so looking forward to this. Uh, we're going to be going to unit four and we'll be talking about the Supreme Court and hot off the presses. A quote by Justice Samuel Alito uh, from this <laughs> summer, which, oh, man, I just can't wait uh, to take a piece of Mr. Alito here uh, kind of stuff. So in until then, all Did right. We, on that episode, are we even going to be involved or are we just going to listen to you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
probably like mostly I'm, I'm going to have a little rant and then you guys are going to slap me down as you normally do and as you probably should uh, there. But part of me thinks that, that at least one of you agrees with me about Alito, uh, Alito's uh, quote there. But uh, we'll have some fun with it. Uh, that's for sure. So until then, peace, love, yogurt, tacos. Bye bye. Bye bonds. And make sure you have a per pernicious, a pernicious. I don't even know how to use it in a sentence. All right. Don't be pernicious to your teachers. No, we'll have to work on that. Peace, love, yogurt, tacos. Bye-bye. <laughs>